evening and welcome to tonight's online event from the British Library, 21st Century Tolkien. My name is Susan Reid and I'm one of the curators of the current British Library exhibition, Fantasy, Realms of Imagination, which this event accompanies. Among the items generously loaned to us are manuscripts of Ursula Le Guin's A Wizard of Earthsea, Neil Gaiman's Coraline and Susanna Clarke's Piranesi. J.R.R. Tolkien is of course present in the exhibition with exhibits including original artwork for The Lord of the Rings by Alan Lee, artist Tova Janssen's unexpected version of Gollum, and Gandalf's staff from Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films, which brings us nicely to the theme of tonight's event. We're delighted to welcome our speakers, Dimitra Fimi, Nick Groom, and John Howe. They will be talking to our chair, Adam Roberts, who combines careers as one of Britain's leading science fiction authors and as Professor of 19th Century Literature at Royal Holloway, University of London, where he teaches both literature and creative writing. Adam is the author of over 20 novels, receiving Arthur C. Clarke Award nominations for Salt, Gradisil and Yellow Blue Tibia, and he won both the 2012 BSFA Award for Best Novel and the John W. Campbell Memorial Award for Jack Glass. You are welcome to submit questions to the panel. Simply use the form below the video window at any point and we'll read out some of the best later on. And if you would like to buy a related book, there is a great selection to be found via the books tab at the top of the screen. So without further ado, I will hand over to Adam to introduce the panel. Thank you, Susan, and hello, everybody. It's uh, I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion and it's, it's so wonderful for me to be in a space, even if it's a virtual space with three such excellent people. Um, 21st century Tolkien. Uh, let me introduce the, the, the panelists. Uh, Professor Nick Groom of the University of Exeter, although I believe at the moment he is in, uh, in the middle of the Pacific somewhere, which is in itself quite exotic and exciting. The author of uh, 21st century Tolkien, What Middle Earth Means to Us Today, which was published 2022, I think. An excellent book that covers a wide range of so what Tolkien was about, and more importantly, what Tolkien means today. Uh, Dr. Dimitra Fimi at the University of Glasgow, a specialist in fantasy and in children's literature, the author of Tolkien, Race and Cultural History, uh, that came out in 20, uh, 2008, um, which won prizes, and A Secret Vice, Tolkien on Invented Languages. We all know how important uh, his invented languages were to Tolkien, which... Um, Demetra co-wrote with Andrew Higgins, which also won prizes. Um, most, most more recently, Celtic Myth in Contemporary Children's Fantasy, 2017. I don't know if that won prizes. It, if it didn't, it surely should have done. Uh, I'm taking from your nod there, Demetra, that it did. And uh, one of the most exciting, uh, two, two of the most exciting critics working in fantasy and Tolkien today. And then um, John Howe, artist and illustrator and conceptual designer, uh, a, a towering figure in in Tolkien in the Tolkien world, illustrated Tolkien's books and uh, board game that uh, Rainer uh, Knizia came up with in, in 2000, um, if I if I'm right, right, the right date, and worked with Alan Lee, designing and doing the artwork that made the visual world of the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings trilogy. 2001 to 2003, uh, and a brilliant artist. And it's so wonderful to have the chance to talk to the, these three people about Tolkien. I mean, I'll start very briefly with myself because I'm old, uh, unlike Demetra and um, and John, who are age cannot with an old custom stale. Um, and I was reading Tolkien as a kid in the early 70s, and my sense is that I I, I didn't feel myself to be part of a kind of larger community back then. And things have changed. It's a slightly strange trajectory. The, the novel comes out in 1954, 1955. It's not unsuccessful, but it's not a big deal. It becomes a big deal in the 1960s. It becomes a campus bestseller and then a, a world bestseller. And then it becomes very influential and lots of imitation books are written, influenced to, to one degree or another by Tolkien through the 80s and the 90s. But to see what Tolkien has become now is to be struck by just how ubiquitous he is, how uh, The Lord of the Rings is everywhere. It clearly, it, it 
reach it has a global reach it touches us in all sorts of ways it's uh, the books are still read the books are still imitated lots of other material by tolkien has been brought out and published uh, we're still fascinated by his his writing and his world building it's adapted into a range of movies not just the peter jackson trilogy and the, the hobbit trilogy that he later made the brings of power uh, tv series which is on amazon at the moment and many, many video games based on The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, but also just a, a fan communities. Um, AO3, which is a, a, an online archive of fan writing. And I checked earlier this afternoon, there are 95,000 separate pieces of fan fiction that people who love Tolkien have written in the world of Tolkien and uploaded to that resource. Some of them novel length, um, fan uh, conventions, cosplay people engaging with Tolkien in the um, in all sorts of interesting creative brilliant ways and I it doesn't surprise me I suppose because I'm, I've been a fan of Tolkien ever since I was a little kid but I'm curious as to how we what, what can we say about that growth that that particular trajectory and I'm going to ask Nick I think first because you wrote a book that was specifically called 21st century Tolkien why do you think Tolkien has spread out and become such a, a major multimodal, multicultural force in the 21st century? What's he saying to us now? Uh, thank you for that introduction, um, Adam. I should just uh, add one thing, which is I'm actually at the University of Macau. Um, Macau, so excuse I, me, not the Pacific, I apologise. But I do hold an honorary position at the University of, of Exeter, so I've got strong links uh, with Exeter as well. But I think that what I really wanted to um, achieve in this book, um, 21st Century Tolkien, uh, was, was really two things. First of all, um, to really approach Tolkien as a, as a writer um, and uh, look at the, the literary value um, of his work. Now, there's been some great work done in things like finding Tolkien as sources um, in Anglo-Saxon, medieval um, and other literary um, traditions. But I really wanted to um, address the work in terms of the um, depth of meaning, the value um, of uh, of this as literature. But that's only, as you suggest, that's only one part of this particular story, because Tolkien is now a, a multi-platform uh, um, writer. I mean, he's more than a writer. Um, he's an inspiration for a whole range um, of activities of uh, radio adaptations, uh, film adaptations, uh, the Amazon Prime uh, video, um, as well as uh, amazing um, artwork and uh, computer games and live action role play. Um, so there's a whole uh, sort of spectrum um, of activity. And I really wanted to respect that uh, because certainly, I mean, like, like you, I began reading Tolkien um, in my youth as a teenager and, you know, you read the books. Um, and then there was the Ralph Bakshi movie uh, that appeared, uh, which uh, is a sort of controversial thing. We might want to touch on that a little bit later. Uh, but there wasn't that sort of certain range of activity. There might have been um, role-playing games such as Dungeons and Dragons. I also played sort of tabletop war games uh, based on uh, based on Middle Earth. Um, but I think that the the real game changer uh, was uh, was Peter Jackson's uh, films. Now they didn't come out of nowhere. They were not just inspired by the Ralph Bakshi movie, uh, 1978, 1979, but also I think the the signal production by the BBC, um, the radio adaptation, uh, which uh, by uh, by Brian Sibley um, and Michael Bakewell from 1981, um, that's really seemed to crystallise uh, the the possibilities uh, for Tolkien. And you certainly had listeners to that, listening to it first and then going to read the books. And that's, that's the big turnaround. Um, I think that we have developed this situation where there are many Tolkien's there's, uh, the work that Tolkien published in his lifetime and the middle earth work is the hobbits and the Lord of the Rings. And you might want to include, uh, the uh, songs of Tom Bombadil. A uh, few people do, but that's it. Um, of course, there's a huge um, hinterland, if you like, of other uh, work, the unfinished Silmarillion. Um, and Tolkien's also writing letters, giving interviews, but there's a, a very uh, modest body of work in Tolkien's um, lifetime uh, that's really um, available uh, for readers. 
Uh, but then it begins to uh, to expand. Um, he's commenting on on his works um, often years later um, in, in in letters. He's rethinking. He's sort of trying to finish the Silmarillion, which was eventually published posthumously, um, edited by Christopher Tolkien and Guy Gabriel Kay. Um, and then we get um, unfinished tales and various miscellaneous publications. And then you get this sort of extraordinary um, series um, of books, The History of Middle Earth, again edited by, by Christopher Tolkien, which really expands um, the, the, the understanding, the conception, uh, the range of Tolkien's achievement. It's uh, awe-inspiring to see the depth of detail uh, that, he, that he went into. And that's not, um, not finished. There's been further volumes published since. There's now uh, 20 volumes of those posthumous publications. But let's say alongside those, you're getting the, the adaptations. Uh, the, the radio adaptations that begin before um, The Return of the King is actually published in 1955. So the first BBC radio adaptation um, of The Fellowship of the Ring uh, appears very, very early. And Tolkien embraces this. I mean, certainly he criticises uh, the way that it's produced, but he sees the possibility of the work as inspiring um, these adaptations, these uh, representations in other media um, uh, and, and artwork, um, obviously, um, as well. Um, and so early on, there are negotiations of films that eventually um, lead to United Artists and acquiring the rights um, and this long process of, um, of planning uh, the films. Uh, which uh, after the false dawn of the ranking bass movies and the and the Ralph Bakshi films really come of age, I think, with Peter Jackson's um, six extraordinary films, which are a real game changer. Uh, they're not only um, really, I mean, fantastically realise um, aspects of Tolkien's uh, vision, but also um, I think revolutionised the movie making um, industry and have massive knock-on effects in terms of um, DVD box sets, um, the, the the extended versions, um, and also the fact that you've got three movies um, in each series made back to back. Um, it guarantees that there's going to be an audience for for several years. So it becomes part of people's lives to be, you know, it's Christmas time. Let's go and see the latest um, Tolkien movie, um, and the fact that um, this then you know, introduces not only a whole new generation, but a whole new um, sector um, of, um, of viewers, of cinema goers, um, and ultimately readers um, to Tolkien. I don't think you can really underestimate uh, the impact um, of that. And so what we now have is a situation uh, where people are coming to Tolkien, maybe through the films first, through video games, um, through the artwork, um, through uh, the Rings of Power, will they get to read the books? Well, eventually, let's hope so. <laughs> so well, why I started writing my book to actually emphasise uh, the literary value um, of Tolkien. But I don't think that we should be too judgmental. I think we should respect uh, the fact that uh, Tolkien is a, a sort of cultural industry, it's a phenomenon um, now, um, and touches many, many different aspects. Um, and it's become uh, you know, a, a very helpful way of thinking through some of uh, our contemporary problems. So that's the first thing I would say is that let's not um, be purist. Um, I mean, it says there's certainly a place for purists, but I think we have to understand that um, new generations um, of potential readers are coming to talking through these other media. The other thing I would say is that um, it really struck me when I was uh, writing this book, which I wanted to write for, for a very long time, um, simply how prescient, how extraordinarily uh, relevant and modern and contemporary uh, Tolkien is for the 21st um, century. Um, and I think there's sort of like two striking examples um, of this. First of all, is in how he presents perspectives from non-human viewpoints. Um, he's very, very good at interpreting the world, uh, and we might want to talk about this a little bit later, uh, from these different um, ways of understanding, ways of comprehending, ways of making sense of the world. Um, you know, famously, he said, you know, he wanted to know what it was like to be a tree, to think as a tree uh, thinks. And so we have uh, the Ents, uh, the Huorns, Old Man Willow um, in the books so offering this sort of um, arboreal perspective on the world, as well as having the Elvish view, uh, the Dwarvish view, uh, the Hobbit view, 
um, and so forth. So these non-human perspectives, I think, are very important for uh, bringing a sense of difference and diversity uh, to our understanding of Tolkien. So I think that is very prescient in that respect. Um, the other respect uh, which I, I found particularly compelling um, and, and timely was that in this, let's hope, post-COVID um, age, uh, we've experienced um, isolation, um, deprivation, um, sort of a sense of being not, not in control um, of our um, lives and our and our sort of um, hopes and ambitions over the past few years. And I, was, I found uh, that Tolkien was one of the writers who really uh, spoke to that. And the reason is because it's he's not writing about the triumph of good over evil at all. I think he's writing about failure, about uncertainty. Um, about ambiguities and um, indeterminacies um, and contradictions and the fact that the world doesn't make sense. Tolkien's often represented as a writer who comes up with this seamless um, conception um, of Middle-earth and it is fantastically complicated um, and detailed um, and rich um, and has this uh, depth um, to it. But part of that depth is the fact that it doesn't make sense it makes sense from a series of different perspectives, um, but it doesn't make total sense. And I love the loose ends he has, uh, the fact that uh, we get these um, characters or, or episodes or explanations that only really go part of the way to explaining uh, things. And we're left as readers with a great deal of freedom, um, I think, uh, to, to try to make sense um, of um, of the world and some of those elements uh, are carried over particularly into Peter Jackson's first three uh, films in, in, in very exciting ways um, I think so there is a, a sense of continuity um, so certainly viewers of the of the films um, if and when they do turn to the books are then going to find that they're, they're rewarded uh, by um, by, by, by this much uh, richer uh, and sort of vibrant uh, realisation of the, of the world that they've already fallen in love with. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the key thing, isn't it? I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's a wonderfully hospitable world. It invites us in. I mean, you quote, I think, in your book, Terry Pratchett saying when he first read Tolkien, it was the first time he felt he'd gone to another world. And that was exactly my experience. And the, the movies, I agree, they're game changers. I'm, I'm curious as to, I'm going to bring in Demetra, I think, why there have been have, have been attempts. You mentioned the Ralph Paxi movie from 1978, which moderately well at the box office, but not well enough for them to fund the second part, which he never made. So that the Baxi movie stops at Helm's Deep and never goes any further. And f attempts to make a kind of fantasy cinema stall, really, through the 70s and 80s and 90s. There was something that Peter Jackson did that changed that. And it was partly he spent a lot of money on it and he brought his <laughs> genius to it. But I wonder if it's also that it's it speaks more specifically to to the twenty first century. There's something particular about now. I mean, Demetra, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think sure, the, the sure. Explanation um, is. Thank you also for having me. I have a little correction to make as well, Adam. As well, I'm a professor of uh, fantasy and children's. Oh, you're a professor. I'm sorry. I'm just getting very recently wrong. learned to know. Um, well, congratulations anyway, on your thank on you your very much. professorship. Um, but um, I, I think. I think there's a number a number of different things that I want to respond to uh, in terms of what um, Nick said. Um, but first of all, that element of immersion I think is quite important, and and that I want to sort of start where Nick ended with with the depth and the richness and the the sort of historical layers that we see in Middle Earth. Um, I think Tolkien was Tolkien's world world was multimodal and, and uh, multifaceted right from the beginning. And, and it was ripe to become this phenomenon. And one of the reasons was that, that as, as, as you said, Adam, he, was, he illustrated, he created languages, he created maps, he created genealogies in all of the things that we, we look at today as elements of, uh, of, of world building um, are there initiated in, in so many ways in his work. Other, other writers had done this sort of thing before, but not at that scale and not with all of those components uh, coming together. So I think there is there is definitely um, inherently a multimodality in Middle Earth that then carries over when it comes to fan communities first uh, engaging with his work. Um, and and I, I see the point uh, about I see I see I, I see the point about sort of uh, 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 calling the um, the Peter Jackson's films as a as a turning of the tide sort of moment. Um, 
but this engagement was there already. You know, the Tolkien Society was um, uh, founded in 1969 when Tolkien was still alive. There were fanzines. Uh, there were fans from uh, from the states sort of uh, approaching him and, and asking questions. And he was inundated with interest for a long, long time before that. Um, so I think what happens in the beginning of the 21st century with the Jackson films is that that sort of the the, the capacity of uh, of the cinematic medium to capture fantasy in a way that doesn't feel contrived as it does, I think, in the Bakshi films in many ways, you know, that, that sort of, um, yeah, the, the, the technical, the technical uh, know-how isn't quite there yet. And it isn't there in fantasy films earlier on, I think. So we have this moment where the, the technical know-how is there. Uh, we have already a huge tradition of illustrating Tolkien uh, in which, you know, John played an, a, a very important role. But at the same time, you also have internet communities coming together. So you have all of these uh, fan activity that was already bubbling in the non um, wife in the non internet world, um, and which has now exploded because people can get together and can discuss these things online in a much much easier way. And Jackson was very very good at harnessing that and and having fan communities involved. And, and consulting and throwing ideas into forums and then having all of those people recognized in the in the credits uh, of the films and, and understanding that that engagement was there and had to be respected and it had to be taken seriously. So I think there's there's a number of, of things that come together at that point in the 21st century. But yes, of course, none of this would work if the story wasn't going to work, if, if the story wasn't relevant for the 21st century. So we have... Uh, um, all of the elements that Nick talked about, the the the, the way that uh, nature is is portrayed, the way that we have a very post-human thinking in terms of how Tolkien is is uh, not not just the trees but animals as well, how their their perspectives are presented. I did, I did a whole a whole um, a whole keynote lecture uh, surrounding foxes and Tolkien, and that one moment of the talk, you know, the, the thinking fox in the Lord of the Rings, which sort of, as Nick was saying, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. There is no explanation of what's going on there, but that's part of the part of the um, fascination of that world. And also, I think a, a big strength uh, of Tolkien's is that it, it is fuzzy around the edges. Uh, we, we do get a lot of world building fantasy uh, more recently that is very nearly clinical you know we're talking about the sort of hard versus soft magical systems and you can see the cogs turning you can you can sort of see the planning that's gone behind it and and we're talking you can't there was a lot of planning that went behind it but there was also points where he threw the plan out of the window and he went with what went naturally uh, in the story i'm rereading the revised and expanded edition of his letters at the moment and that's coming through really clearly to me that uh the, the plan can, can can go you know it's the story and the characters are are um guiding the story and the plot um but yeah I, th I think all of these things are coming together but for me um and and you know that that's hopefully will be a nice bridge with with uh with john's work for me the first encounter with tolkien was actually um seeing a student of mine i was still i was i was uh i was uh, still a, a student of the university of athens at the time and seeing a student of mine i was teaching english as a foreign language reading uh the silmarillion translated into greek with john's gandalf uh, illustration of the cover so it's a very it's it's absolutely amazing for me to be in the in the same uh, forum with John today and sort of pay tribute to the fact that it was his illustration that got me interested and I started thinking oh what is that that looks very 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 interesting and then fortunately you know I was I was able to sort of read read the work uh, in English or you know in the original and I was then back then sort of had to order the books and had to wait for the books no Amazon you know we're talking about a, a different sort of time but it's that immersion it's that it's that feeling for me it was a feeling of falling inside a world that is complex that is fully formed in many ways but at the same time not quite fully formed not quite you know clinical in that way so all yeah. these things together I think I like that you talk about it written in the original English because of course the old red book's not written in English it's written in one of Tolkien's <laughs> invented languages. I mean, I'm really, I mean, I, 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 I I'm more to than talk, happy to talk about the languages if you want to <laughs> talk about. I mean, I just, it's the adaptation is, it's clearly the kind of work, it's hospitable, not just to readers who can fall into this world and live it. It's, it's hospitable in ways that allow people to you know, change it and adapt it. And there, there aren't very many female characters in the, in the original book, but that's not how the adaptations have, have gone forward. And I know, your book on the cultural history of race and the way race gets represented in Tolkien and that's 
it was part of that diversity of of how yeah absolutely there is, there is room there. there there is room there for these uh for, for, for reading the work differently and for pulling out uh, elements that that we we might want to expand upon or to develop uh and and you mentioned fan fiction before that's one of the one of the big contributions i think of fan fiction uh in terms of uh Tolkien scholarship as well it's sort of trying to see where the gaps are uh what would we like to see in middle earth but if we didn't like middle earth we wouldn't engage at that level with it we wouldn't be looking at the gaps as we would be looking at the gaps as problematic we would be sort of shutting shutting down that world but we don't want to do that we feel like we want to fill in the gaps and that it allows for those gaps to be filled in that way um so, so yeah, the, the, the female characters is, is a major one. Um, the representation of race is another one that has become a, a, a major um, uh, topic of debate. Uh, and I think I think adaptations have tried to sort of address this. Um, the, the, the Ring of Powers adaptation for all of its problems, and I, there were a number of things I liked about it and there were a number of things I didn't. I think had a, they did exactly the right thing by opening up uh, the 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 fixed way of thinking about the different peoples within Tolkien's world as belonging to a particular sort of phenotype, uh, and that was absolutely the right thing to do. I'm interested, um, Adam, that you've uh, you, you've twice mentioned hospitality, um, and I think that, that that that's sort of something which um, I think is uh, developed in both uh, uh, the Tolkien's writing and also the uh, the films in perhaps unexpected ways, because you know, from the very beginning. Uh, sort of Bil Bilbo is a, is a victim of his own hospitality because he keeps letting these dwarves um, come in, um, and th that sort of motif is repeated at different points um, in the in the book. For example, when they arrive at Bjorn's house, but it's also something that Tolkien is doing in the actual structure um, of the composition um, of both the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings by letting in every um, sort of literary style. Um, every sort of genre that he wants to include, it's it has sort of a capacity to include uh, the, uh, the 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 comic, uh, the um, epic, um, the the weird um, times as well. I think yes, uh, certainly, and, and and travel writing and um, this sort of fate, what he calls feigned history. Um, so it's it's yeah, pastoral it's, and, and cartography. I mean, the, that was and, one and of my experiences as a pouring Absolutely. over the maps that were written and imagining not just tracing the adventures that I'd been reading about, but imagining what else might be happening in other portions of Middle Earth. Sorry, I interrupted you, Nick. No, absolutely, because in that sense, it's experimental fiction. It's, it's include, it has um, a lot of uh, prefatory material. It has the maps, the illustrations, a lot of appendices, uh, which actually change the way that, um, uh, that readers might um, understand the books but then this is also carried over again I think into into the films particularly Peter Jackson's films which which do combine um you know biblical epic uh with uh with comedy uh with the developing uh, genre of fantasy and as uh, Dimitri as I think quite rightly says um a respect for the internet based uh fan uh groups as well which which is very uh which is very significant so that sort of sense of being um open um, to different influences um, and to different styles, um, I think is one of the ways in which different readers and different viewers um, the films uh, can can really be inspired. Um, and uh, it's not a fixed genre uh, fantasy uh, work um, either um, in 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 the book or its adaptations. Um, it can actually be uh, developed and experienced and enjoyed in this sort of multiplicity. Um, of ways. If I could also just uh, brief, very briefly say something about this sort of question of race, which of course um, I think has become um, you know, very significant of late. This is sort of something which I um, invite um, readers to uh, to, re to reconsider um, in, in some ways in, in my own work, because I mean, I think when we're talking about elves, humans, dwarves, um, hobbits, um, orcs, ants, and so forth, we're talking about species um, and in terms of, I mean, nearly all of these species have have different racial types within them. Uh, but whether we can really compare um, a mortal human with an immortal um, elf who has a very, uh, what I call sort of alvocentric way of perceiving the world, which is different from the dwarocentric uh, way, which is how, how dwarves perceive the world. And this is something which Tolkien is alive to. Uh, for example, when he has Legolas and Gimli trying to explain to each other 
variously the beauty of, of trees and forests and the natural world. And then Gimli is trying to explain the beauty um, of uh, rocks and grottos um, and the this sort of lithic, this stone uh, world. They don't really have the language uh, to, to, to be able to communicate. They're, they're open to the to the possibility. Uh, but with talking, it's, it's, it's a language which defines uh, these uh, different uh, perspectives, these are diff different worldviews. Um, and the way that he does posit these languages is, is, is through um, sort of species interaction, um, I think. Let me bring, let me go to John. I'm um, talking of interpretations, talking of uh, coming and bringing your own kind of artistic imagination to bear on this these works. Could you say something about how how about I mean I, we all agree on the, the magnitude of the the art that you have created that you're real doing your version you're creating a version of what you've read in the books how, how does that process work? Uh, thank you that, that's a very very good question I, I've been listening intently to what everyone's been saying and I wish I could take I wish I could have taken notes because it's I've it's already broadened my view of of things, but I, I, I try to approach it very intuitively. Obviously, there is a given body of work, uh, you know, a, a literary, a literary oeuvre, which is what it is. Uh, so that must not be contradicted in any sense. Beyond that, uh, what Tolkien does is he's an incredibly visual writer. And he writes literally in imagery. And not only does he give us a number of, you know, pertinent details, but he also leaves quite a lot out in favor of describing the emotions of the characters that are involved in any particular scene or, or environment. And, uh, and that is a pure gift to anyone who has the obligation to try and render tangible something of the imagination and that is the elbow room in which a person can really bring in not only the respect for the literary work but also the experience that goes beyond uh your own personal preferences uh a sense of whatever it is that excited you or that, that, that or that uplifted you when you when, when when you read the text all of those things can come into play in a very instinctive manner. So, I mean, I, I'm, I, I can only say this because it's not something that I analyze before I do a picture. Um, when I have a, a scene to do, or I've chosen a scene that I want to do, I generally try and start uh, with no idea what I want to do. And then I'm confident that somewhere along the line, I will find the points of contact that make it work if you like for me which i'm going to try and infuse <clears throat> into the work in the hope that those points of contact will be established with any viewer so it's it's the opposite of politics in the sense that um you know i of course i care very much uh what the fans think without the fans probably none of us would be here uh but nonetheless uh, artistic liberty is the only thing which can allow you to reach out into this world and find the images that you know that may strike a chord. So I just do I just do pictures, basically. Could you show us some pictures? Well, I bought up. Um, if you could bring up slide number one, uh, that is my very first uh, illustration which was which ended up being published i think i did it way back in the late 70s obviously it's a gandalf and a balrog done in gouache very messy very um very amateur but you know something in that scene had obviously meant a lot to me and i've done a huge number of gandalfs and balrogs since um but that was perhaps uh, an image that i'm fond of uniquely because uh it was one of the first ones that i actually took to be to 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 being finished 
Um, you know, I would not do the red light on the staff anymore. Um, you know, on all, all of those things, it, it, it's the work of a very young artist. Um, if you'd like to bring up uh, number three. This is perhaps one of the best known images. Uh, unfortunately, I no longer have the original, which was stolen mm -hmm. during an exhibition. Oh. But it's become one of those images that uh, has had a number of ramifications, if you like. It was, a, I believe, a certain amount of inspiration for Peter and, uh, and his depiction of Gandalf in the movies. It's also one of those pictures which, for me, sums up the ambiguity and the multiplicity of Lord of the Rings. Is where is Gandalf going? Where has he just been? Is he late? You know, what's he thinking about? All of these things are more questions than answers. And I think that's one of the fundamental qualities of any illustration dealing with a fantasy world is it should be asking as many questions as it provides answers. And, uh, you know, so that, that's, that's one picture that I still have, um, still very fond of. If we could bring up the next one, number four. I had no idea it had been stolen. John, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, uh, it, it's it was a long time ago, so I, I recovered. But it's um, it was one of those things. I had a number of images stolen from an exhibition, a number of paintings rather, and that's one of the ones that is still missing. So I don't know if it still exists or if it's been if it's been destroyed. But um, the the Hobbit uh, dwelling was done for Harper Collins as a the cover of a little booklet for the map of the Hobbit. And it, at the time, it summed up uh, how I felt about Hobbit dwellings. And I was very, very conscious as I was doing it of Tolkien's own drawing of the entry to Bag End, which I found to be absolutely fascinating, not necessarily from an inspirational point of view, but from an information point of view, where you saw that as an artist, he was struggling with the tangible problems of depicting what he wrote. And on the wall of that, um, of Tolkien's bag end of the entrance, there are a couple of paintings which are suspended on the wall. And he was still working out, and you can see it in the in the illustrations, how he's actually going to get pictures hanging on a, on, on, on a concave wall. So there's one where the frame is actually bent to fit the wall, and another one where it's kind of hanging out into the into the vestibule. So, you know, I, for me, it exemplifies the dangers and difficulties of taking something which lives primarily in the minds of the readers and trying to propose an image. And that's, you know, clearly, clearly dangerous territory to tread in. Uh, maybe we'll just bring up one more. Um, how about if we bring up uh, number seven? Mm -hmm. So th this is a small detail uh, from another image. The background and foreground are traditionally painted, but the Tom Bombadil is a digital um, uh, edition. So it, it for me, it's not only the you know a personal passage between traditional artwork and digital artwork uh, in 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 my life, but it's also um, witness to a, a real evolution of Bombadil as a character for me. And I started out with a very jolly one, a very, um, a very hobbity Tom Bombadil to move along to a much, I, I hope, um, more ambiguous Bombadil, uh, which would be this one here. So, you know, that to say that anything that I've done uh in the past anything everything is a proposition there's nothing fixed in stone it's not engraved in marble it's a proposition uh and i've been always been fascinated by the capacity or the incapacity of an image to stay in um in in people's in people's minds and you know there is a gigantic quantity of tolkien related artwork that's been done over over the decades and why do some seem to stick? Why do others simply fall by the wayside and uh, and are forgotten? And it's it's something that's fascinated me because it 
it evokes as well the the whole nature of image building how we, how images come to be what we expect you know how is it that we know what dragons look like or dwarves or elves everyone knows but we know you know none of us have ever seen any and um and that process for me that passage from the particular into the general from any given story or anecdote into into common culture is one that I'm absolutely fascinated with. That's really, really interesting, John. And I, I absolutely agree. There's a, you know, a wide range of really fascinating illustrations by all sorts of different artists, including Tolkien. And I love Tolkien's pictures, but they are, I suppose, quite quaint, quite mannered, uh, very much drawings. Whereas your art is, it, it has a, a realist, immediacy it has a you know grandeur and a vividness and that's kind of become the visual idiom in which we think of of middle earth i'm going to read out a couple of questions have, have come in there's a couple specifically for you john and then there's some more for the rest of the panel it's a question from kalel valo who wants to after praising you a fan of your work for many years been loving every piece you've made especially gandalf and the balrogs and the gandalfs and i'm not sure what the plural of balrog is Balrogin, perhaps, um, of Chazam Doom. I would like to ask, what was it like to work and design the illustrations for the films? Was it really time-consuming? Uh, working in 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 the movie industry is a is another another creature entirely from from working as an independent illustrator. It's a very collaborative environment with a lot of people working on the same subject. And uh, for something like the Balrog, I believe. You know that Alan and I had a leg up in a sense because we'd both done a lot of illustrations, which uh, Peter and Fran had, you know, pasted on the walls of their office. So we already there were our, our work was already in their minds, and the uh, the Balrog went very naturally from previous illustrations to the version that um, that appears on the screen passing through the hands of one of, of several of the fabulous sculptors at Weta Workshop, uh, then on through to Weta Digital. So it's, you know, it's a long, long process. And uh, it wasn't, I, sh I shouldn't say it was easy because nothing is ever easy in the movie business, but, but it was, in a sense, it seemed to flow naturally. And you can never really tell in advance uh, in any project of that nature what is going to be done quickly and what is going to take forever. So, but but it was a very, a very natural feeling process. And I have to say that um, by the time the first 20 minutes were shown at the Cannes F Film Festival, um, my family and I had already come back home. So we hadn't seen the final versions of many, many things. And uh, we went to Cannes and we saw the 20 minutes and it ended with the combat between Gandalf and the Balrog. And we were speechless because it, it goes, you know, through that collaborative effort and all of those hundreds of people working on a project like that, it just goes beyond whatever it is that you could imagine by yourself. Absolutely fascinating. I, uh, there's another question um, from Jake Hodgson who said, feels very honoured to be watching a live stream interview with all of you amazingly talented people and Tolkien scholars. I have a question for everyone, but mainly directed towards John Howe, but we'll take some of the heat off you, John. Perhaps we can all address this. I was wondering why, why you think it's important to have fantasy-based art and stories in the modern world? And that's a really interesting question, actually, because the, we, could, we could just have art that represents the world that we live in. We can have stories that are set in our world. What is it about fantasy and I think this goes back to where we, we started in this conversation. Increasingly, it seems, we are fascinated by the worlds of fantasy. Is it merely escapism? Is there something else going on on the kind of visual side that you're working with, John, or just thinking about fantasy writing more generally for Demetra and Nick? Mm -hmm. I'd be tempted to call the, you know, what we call medieval fantasy in a sense the very in, in me medieval in the very wide wide sense uh i for me it's the biggest fan zone in the world and it is a territory which is occupied you know by by dozens of authors of whom tolkien is perhaps the perhaps the largest realm in that 
in that in, in that world. And um, as uh, I think everyone agrees, it's an inclusive world in that it's it evokes all of the wonderful stories, epics, legends, myths that make us what we are culturally, but it offers us um, a seat right, right, right next to the writer, right next to the action, if you like. And uh, so it, it's inclusive in that sense. And uh, and I think it's, you know, it, it's important because it's also the world of what if. Well, let's what what if things were like this? Or how about that? Or how about if we imagine if? And because it's such a an inclusive world, uh, then it 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 cries out for imagery. And once again, because of the multiplicity of platforms involved, uh, you know, it, it simply is it it devours imagery you know, endlessly. And uh, so it's been, you know, um, it, it's been so far, as far as I'm concerned, a very, um, a very rewarding journey in that I found Tolkien to be um, opening a door into not only his world, but also into all those worlds beyond Tolkien, which are his sources, his, his loves and dislikes, his, his inspirations. And, and that is literally endless. And it's into those worlds that as uh, a person trying to propose some tangible form to his writing, or tangible visual form, if you like, it's into those worlds that you have to reach beyond Tolkien, into those worlds behind, and try and find in there the spark that, you know, that that, that ignites your, your passion. And, that, and that's... Um, you know, I think I think that's one of the reasons why Tolkien uh, is so popular. Is that yes, he's writing a story. Yes, it takes us from the characters that we get, learn to know and love from A to B. Um, but he's writing about so many other things entirely. You know, and 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 we're not necessarily registering all that as we read. But that's why I wish I was taking notes when uh, when the two of you were. We're mentioning the the multiplicity and the fuzzy edges and the loose ends of Tolkien. That's perhaps where the real magic lies. Demetra. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a it's a huge question and it's one that uh, I I talk about with my students a lot. We run a, a whole master's program on fantasy here at Glasgow. Um, if we think about fantasy more generally as narratives of the impossible. Um, then actually it opens up possibilities, interestingly. And, and uh, I very much agree with what John was saying before, that it is the, it is the narratives of the what if. It, 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 uh, fancy allows us to imagine the world differently, uh, to imagine it possibly, to imagine possibly a better world, or to possibly even imagine how things could go really, really worse if we allow certain things to continue. <laughs> the way that they are so there's there's that the thought experiment sort of element of it and that's not just fantasy that does that obviously science fiction does that as well um but the other side is is the the more sort of primeval or the, the, the sort of older need uh, that goes back centuries and 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 more than that uh, that humanity has to tell stories that are not possible to explore difficult things, uh, things that we're anxious about, things that we are trying to deal with and that are more difficult or more thorny uh, to deal with. And I'm talking here about myths and legends and folk tales and, and the way of metaphorically or symbolically talking about uh, um, our anxieties, our fears, our hopes as well. Um, and and fantasy is particularly good at uh, read invigorating these these past tales but it also shows that in 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 modern times we 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 still need this you know we still need this um uh, seeing through susan Kubert says that uh, i'm writing um fancy is like seeing through the, through the, the corner of your eye it's seeing something through the corner of your eye and sort of misinterpreting it a bit but actually you actually are seeing something that is there you're just seeing it from a slightly different perspective so it's more about reality than we might want to, you know, that, that it might look at, at the surface. You know, we, we talked about uh, how Tolkien is, is uh, responding to um, conflicts of his time. You know, he's writing, he's writing the bulk of the Lord of the Rings during the Second World War, remembering all of the, all of the uh, trauma 
uh, and his experiences during the First World War, and he's writing about a war situation at the same time. Um, he's being asked, you know, by by German publishers just before to declare Ar Aryan uh, uh, descent, and he's he's refusing to do that. And then again, we see a story there in which different peoples have to come together and they have to understand each other, just as as we were as we were saying before. So it, it, it fantasy is is a different way of confronting the real. I think in some ways, in some ways, it's a more effective way of confronting the real. It's 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 a it, it allows you know for those bigger bigger questions to be explored in different ways. I think that's right. Also, as you say, the science fiction, although science fiction is is a rather different thing. These are metaphorical literatures, a ways of of representing the world without reproducing the world and that's exactly. what fiction does as a whole it's a, a kind of lie that tells tells the truth i just wonder specifically with fantasy whether there's um it, because it's it's historical or it's pseudo historical it's what john is saying about the kind of medieval or the old anglo-saxon worlds that so fascinated Tolkien. it's not it's not always though is it you know there, this is a particular brand of fantasy that that Tolkien uh yeah. really really brought to 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 the you know pu public imagination and and championed and made into a marketable genre but fantasy can also be urban fantasy or it can be uh in, intrusion fantasy in which we it is set in the world as we know it and our world is disrupted by the impossible or by the magical or by the um is there always a connection with the past a lot of the time there is yes and in some ways you could say that fantasy is a particularly good way of engaging with the past and making sense of the past um but but not necessarily no I, I don't think we can generalize there uh, Tolkien's fantasy the medievalist fantasy if, if, if you want is one sub sub genre sub branch yeah, a, a sizable one but not the only one and now, increasingly, in the 21st century, fantasy is a global phenomenon and fantasy is being written out of non-Eurocentric backgrounds, African fantasies and Eastern, Asian fantasies and so on. And that's, of course, that's true. But I'm, I think I'm, I'm wondering about something particular that the German sociologist, Max Weber, said that we live now in a disenchanted world. That's the nature of modernity, industrial modernity. You're quite right, Tolkien fought in the first great industrialized war, a horrific experience, not just because his friends were being killed, but on an industrial scale, this sense that we have lost the, some magic, some sense of, kind of wonder. I mean, it, when Weber says that we live in a disenchanted world, he means it quite specifically. Well, the Canadian yes. philosopher, uh, yes, Charles and, Taylor. And I think, I think the, ink, the Inklings thought that as well. I think that yeah. C.S. Lewis and, and, and Chesterton before, you know, had this feeling that somehow we, we're losing something, we're losing something metaphysical potentially, or 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 a belief into something outside the empirical. And again, fantasy is quite good at uh, exploring um, exploring this lack potentially. That, that that is a that is a very big question to sort of try and 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 nail down here. And 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 I know there are research projects that are happening right now uh, in terms of reception that that are trying to to to, to to actually exactly look at that point, you know, is is there a, 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 a is is another reason for why Tolkien in the twenty first century is continuing, uh, um, you know, reaping this popularity because we are in a post Christian world as well, potentially in a more much more secularized world. Um, it, it's yeah, I, I, it, it's difficult to speculate at, at this point. I, th I think we're going to see a lot more work on this, and it is a developing area in fantasy studies more generally. And it's what Nick was saying right at the beginning about you know, having been through lockdown, this sense of perhaps now more than ever, we're feeling deracinated and, and alienated. And uh, these are these, these stories of transport and wonder and magic and enchanted worlds, enchanted for good and evil. And, you know, there, there's wonder and magic there, but there's also kind of terror there, which used to be the case in the in the old enchanted way of doing things. What do you I think, Nick? This idea of, uh, of re-enchantment is, is is very important, and I think that it's something that you're quite right um, that uh, that the Inklings and Tolkien was um, you know concerned to try to to try to recapture. And uh, I was interested in what sort of Dimitri was saying that you know fantasy is a way of imagining the world differently, um, but it's, uh, it's it's more about reality, and that's certainly um, I think the case with Tolkien. But of course, Tolkien was. Uh, was was writing at a time when the the fantasy genre wasn't recognised in the way that it is um, today, um, and yeah, you know, Dimitri's the, uh, the 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 expert here. Uh, but I wonder whether uh, we actually risk losing 
um, something by compartmentalizing um, Tolkien or uh, the art of John or the or the uh, the movies of, of Peter Jackson by by calling them fantasy, uh, whereas in fact maybe we should be sort of trying to erode um, and challenge um, the distinctions with other um, artists. I mean. William Blake, for example, I mean, would have called him a fantasy writer or a fantasy artist or um, the, the Anglo-Scottish ballad tradition um, has many of the similar elements. But you wouldn't really say that that was fantasy or even a, um, a work like Macbeth, uh, which has got sort of witches and ghosts um, and um, a very sort of strong sense of um, doom um, or, or fate about it. And it's got you know, it's the inspiration in some sense uh, for the uh, for the March of the Ents um, and the um slaying of the uh, of the witch king um so it's maybe sort of it's, it's, it's sort of there in maybe the sort of the, the prehistory um of fantasy but i um i mean I'd, I'd, I'd rather just call Tolkien a um a writer and an artist in the same way that i think that sort of john, john is an artist and, and to uh sort of try to classify um his work as, as fantasy art uh, risks uh, pigeonholing it. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I, I was really sort of struck again by looking at the the few images uh, uh, that uh, that um, he shared. There's an amazing consistency to your work, uh, John. It sort of it just sort of create this sort of texture, uh, which is which I think is, is very rich, um, and it does uh, reflect that sort of depth that I was trying to um, suggest um, at, at the beginning of, um, of of this talk. Then that that's one of the ways in which I think your your work really um, captures. Um, the the Middle Earth spirit, um, and another th thing that really interests me is how Tolkien very rarely focuses on uh, close ups of human expressions. Rather, he's dealing with figures in an environment. Um, that's something which struck me when I reread the uh, the books after seeing the the Peter Jackson films. Peter Jackson has lots of very close close ups, um, and you, you you see that the beads of sweat and the um, scars on the face. And there was certainly you know Tolkien had sources in in, in Viking. Um, saga, for example, where it does have close-ups of faces, but he doesn't really include those close-ups in his own writing. And I think that that's something uh, which um, John's work captures um, in, in many instances as well. It's the fact that the, 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 these figures are situated, they are located, you know, within particular um, environments, very sort of uh, vibrant and suggestive environments, um, landscapes, uh, cityscapes, uh, ruins, um, twilights, and so forth. And I think that that comes across very, uh, very powerfully, um, and uh, is, as I say, is, is, is a wonderful way of, 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 of capturing that spirit. I mean, it's complicated to. Um, I mean, once again, everything I say is the fruit of. Um, the the imagery that I've 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 worked on during my life and none of this is it's it's none none of none of none of the analysis that I can make of it has any sense outside of what I've of the conclusions I very confusedly arrived at through the work but there is there there are a number of things uh, uh, particular to Tolkien but also apply to in in a wider sense to anything that is of the fantastical whether it's you know myth legend or or modern fantasy every you know from William Morris on uh, is there is the navigation you're between two very sharp reefs one is stereotype one is archetype and you're you're navigating continually towards the archetype but your danger is that you be swept you know uh, on the rocks of stereotype and that that's complicated to manage but once again I think that the the writing of an author like Tolkien invites us to imagine depth. It invites us to imagine multiple sources, contradictory elements, um, you know, things that don't necessarily make sense any more than, say, the dragon makes sense in Beowulf. He doesn't make sense, but he's there, and and that for that in Tolkien is is one of the more fascinating aspects of it, coupled with the fact that it is very rare as uh, a person who deals in imagery to actually stumble into a universe where everything appeals to you and that that is very much the case with middle earth there is nothing in middle earth that that that, that i don't care for if you like um and the the the, the number of times or perhaps i should, i should start i should start again the vastness and depth of this world 
is is difficult to imagine before you start to actually put it into pictures. And the number of times that um, that we would find ourselves in Middle Earth working for Peter, whether for Lord of the Rings or for The Hobbit, and um, and standing somewhere in an imagined uh, environment and looking off towards the horizon and thinking, oh yeah, the Blue Mountains are that way. Um, you know, the, the, the Ang Band is, you know, I mean, all, all of these wonderful other realms that Tolkien hints at, but, we, but never takes his characters to. All of those places where you know very well the script is going to make you turn around and head back to territory you know already. And that was one of the one of the major longings that I have retained from the from these projects is that it's it's just not possible to go everywhere. And um, I have a very pedestrian approach to uh, any environment, if you like, which particularly applies to filmmaking. Is I like to do a sketch from a distance away uh, to figure out where I am, and then I'll walk into that sketch you know, a few hundred yards or whatever distance seems appropriate and then draw what I see. I'll walk into that sketch and draw what I see. And you end up in the middle of, a, of the environment, whether it's a city or a cave or, a, you know, a, a forest. And, um, and I find that approach to be much more intuitive and I hope um, closer to what to what people might imagine than actually simply sitting down and trying to do the whole thing in one shot. Uh, you know, you, you kind of want that time to imagine yourself in a landscape walking into it. And uh, and that's 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 a process which I which I really enjoy very, very much. You know, the other design processes are very different, um, whether it's designing weaponry or creatures or characters or you know, um, I, I, I've had the pleasure of working on not only the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies, but also um, the Rings of Power, also a short stint on the War of the Rohirrim. Um, so, you know, you, 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 you get to participate in all of these visions of Middle Earth, which are driven always by people who are passionate about it. And what is really exciting is to arrive in a situation like that, where your job is fairly straightforward, you just have to make the pictures. Uh, you just have to bring something up as a as a talking point, as a as a point of discussion to start really work, to start to start the the development of a of a project. And um, I find that exchange to be absolutely fascinating. And I think some of the best work that I've ever done for movie projects is when the director says, you know, well, I like that and I like that and that's nice. But he's not going to give you a green light. He's not going to say, okay, let's let's make this. He's going to send you back to your drawing table, uh, absolutely burning with desire to find out what he wants. And um, and leaving you the opportunity to bring in what you feel is right. So somewhere conjugating those those, those different things, you arrive at something which is which is grander quite often grander than you could have done by yourself. So there's this wonderfully collaborative notion uh, in that sense to these projects, whereas working by yourself uh, at home in a studio, you're, you're your own boss. So, you know, it's a very different proposition. Really interesting to hear you say all that, John. And I think you're absolutely right. Tolkien's not, he's not really interested in individuals. He's not interested in the Byronic hero or the last action hero. He's interested in communities. He's interested in the environment. He's interested in the, the ways we kind of come together. And that's why he's so interested in languages because languages are the, the way that we communicate. And as you say, filmmaking is a collaborative process. It's a, a team coming together. That's really, really interesting. I mean, we're into the last quarter of an hour of our session. I wish it would go on longer, I have to say, but, um, I'm going to try a few more questions that are coming in. I'm not sure we're going to get through all of the questions. A lot are coming in. One from Alana Wheat asks what we would suggest for starting points to get into world building like Tolkien. Just following off from John was saying, um, maybe you need to spend your entire life mm -hmm. developing a, <laughs> a stage of this kind of scope. 
And I just want to be true was saying earlier, what you were saying earlier about how kind of schematic a lot of fantasy world building is, how it's a set of systems. I'm, I'm worried, you know, that question, that sort of question worries me because it, it worries me that, uh, that that we'll end up with advice where somebody just has to sit down and plan the whole thing, which is exactly against what John was, was, was just uh, examining here. I think... Um, it, the Tolkien model is far more organic and it, and it took a long time of gestation and that shows, I think. Um, and uh, th I don't think there was ever um, a systematic sort of uh, attempt to bring it all together, which is one of the reasons why the Silmarillion never got finished. The one thing that was quite systematic, but then he got lost into it and fell into rabbit holes was the languages because that was his day job and he knew exactly how to design a language uh, or, you know, philologically sort of uh, um, explore how a language might develop, for example. Uh, but yeah, that, the, 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 the idea that somehow there is, there is a technique or a method is, is slightly making me sort of, yeah, it, it's slightly worrying me. I I think it's it's more about feeling your way, isn't it? Uh, and and um, I've heard uh, successful fantasy authors recently talking a lot about how often it is the story that leads you to the points where you need to develop the world to sort of uh, um, uh, follow your characters or follow the plot, which again sounds very similar to what John was describing in terms of feeling out and and, and uh, more organically. Um, um, interpreting uh, a story in this case and turning it into a setting for example um we, there are good the... guides out there you know there are you, you can look at nk mm -hmm. jemison has some very good advice on her blog about uh, how to possibly go about uh, but if you were on the tolkienian model work very hard for many many decades and keep on changing it <laughs> but well, actually this, this is how tolkien wrote i mean he, he didn't have a plan um, Tom Shippey has um, already pointed this out. Um, he, he discovered the story. Um, he was exploring. Um, he, was, he was trying to find out uh, what, you know, he, 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 I mean, he starts off um, writing a, a, a long expected party as a, um, as, as a repetition um, or a return to an unexpected party in The Hobbit. And then um, he sort of says, and these, these black riders have suddenly turned up and I don't know who they are or where they're from. Um, you know, he hadn't worked out the significance um, of the ring. So he was really, um, I mean, he goes through the world um, in, 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 in a sense, feelingly, which is how a uh, word that Shakespeare uses in um, in King Lear. He is feeling his way through it. Um, and part of that, um, as um, we also suggested, is, is, is collaboration. It's working, working with other people. You know, he, he didn't just... Uh, work as part of the the inklings and, and shared his, um, his 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 writing with C.S. Lewis, but he also um, you know has his characters uh, very, very rarely um, being as as you suggested these sort of uh, single individuals, but always working in small groups, working together, cooperating, uh, realizing that small communities um, are the way to actually um, solve problems and, and face challenges uh, rather than. Um, some sort of isolated individuals. So I think that that sort of sense of, of, of companionship, camaraderie um, is, um, is, 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 is very, very significant. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not going to be the, the total vision of uh, some sort of uh, singular artist uh, that Tolkien is, um, is, 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 is producing. Um, it's going to be something which is um, workshops, if you like, um, over many years, um, and um, and eventually um, discovered and and, and crystallised into a form that can be shared with others. You know, I think I think of the Inklings and the Tolkien and his friends meeting in a pub, and it makes me. I mean, it's partly that community idea and like workshopping is a is a good way of talking about it. But it also makes me think it's it it makes the Lord of the Rings a kind of oral history. We think yeah. it was a printed book, and that's how I first read it. I read it reading the pages, but it's it's so alive to language spoken language and its poetry and the, and the poetry of its prose um, and as part of that community i do have some sort of follow-up question eleanor um what role do you all see tolkien's work playing in bringing together people of different faiths and philosophies in times that are so divisive so this follows on from what we're saying about kind of community and i think that's a sense that we've mentioned fandom several times and i'm you know i'm a professor at the university of london but i'm also a fan of Tolkien, and I'm, I'm still the same a, a fan that I was when I was 12 when I first read the, the books. Do we think he's he brings people together from different faiths and philosophies? Is that part of Tolkien in the 21st century? 
I think there's definitely an, an international um, readership and an international fandom now in a way that uh, maybe maybe there always was, but we, we weren't able to sort of conceptualize it or see the links across the globe in a, in a, in a clear way before. Um, I, I think that is true. You know, we, the, the scholarship on Tolkien has also bloomed and flourished and, and expanded in areas that um, might have bewildered him, but it, it it's opening up... Um, it's opening up uh, other traditions coming in and talking and talking about their their engagement with Tolkien's work. Other lang people from uh, uh, who speak other languages or people who are from different uh, sort of spiritual traditions, for example. Um, and 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 I sort of yeah I sort of danced around mentioning or not mentioning it, but I, I've got a PhD student at the moment uh, and a funded PhD student who's working on. Um, yeah, it's Tom, Tom Emmanuel, who's working on, um, who's working specifically on how uh, uh, non-religious fans of Tolkien are actually constructing uh, part of their spirituality through the work. And he's very, very, uh, um, he's looking at perspectives, global perspectives, really here. Because again, another way of pigeonholing Tolkien is thinking about him as a Christian writer, which he was, you know, and that's how he saw himself. But his work goes well beyond that and speaks to well beyond uh, that one tradition or that one sort of uh, uh, way of uh, seeing the world, you know, either spiritually or philosophically. So, yeah, I think his work has the potential to do that. Uh, and it's that openness, it's that sort of ambiguity, the, 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 the contradictions, the complexities, all of these that allow that to happen. So, yeah, I can't speak for Tom's results yet, but uh, they will be out there at some point soon. I think it's a shared frame of reference. Uh, but within that frame of reference, there are going to be many different uh, ways of entering um, and leaving it and, and, and making sense of it. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, the historian Ronald Hutton um, suggests is that you know, if we do treat um, Tolkien as a uh, simply as a Christian writer, and of course he was a, he was a devout Tridentine uh, Ro Roman Catholic, uh, but then he doesn't he doesn't push that um, in the um, in the writing because he actually he, he makes. Um, his work much, much much more open, and I think it would diminish, um, you know, particularly the Lord of the Rings, um, to to say that it can only be uh, really sort of fully grasped uh, from from one perspective. It's uh, you know part of its power and its longevity, um, and I think this is carried through into other areas of adaptation as as, as well. Um, is the fact that it can be uh, you know, rethought uh, by um, by sort of other. Uh, by other groups, um, faiths, um, beliefs, um, and that sort of sense of not being limited, um, of, of of having that capacity uh, for for rethinking and reinvention, um, is you know one of the things that characterises um, Tolkien's work and also of the, the adaptations. Um, I think in in many cases, uh, in the same way that it does of the um, of some of the most interesting writers of, of the of the Western canon. Um, and the, the way that I describe it is it's sort of Tolkien think with, uh, he provides the materials uh, for, uh, for thinking. Um, and, you know, through, you know, his sort of thought experiments um, and the uh, ways that he can present um, issues and problems um, that, you know, remain relevant um, to the challenges it faces today. That's the secret, uh, really, uh, rather than um, being inert. He's a very sort of active writer who gets you working. Uh, who gets you, uh, you know, fully engaged um, in? And now there are so many opportunities uh, to do that across a whole range um, of, of different activities. It's, uh, it's 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 an inspiring field, but I wouldn't want to limit it in any way to one particular uh, position. I think there's also a um, an ecological facet to Tolkien's writing, which I find particularly inspiring. Is that this is a world which we can clearly identify with. It has mountains we might recognize. Um, you can take a, you can pinpoint a certain number of places in Middle Earth on our own Earth. Um, but there's a magic to it. There's a scope, and there's a there there's a grandeur to it, which um, which we tend to forget because you know we have we have busy lives and we we forget to appreciate simple things. Um, the uh, simple things uh, are, are of nature, and that's one of the roles of the hobbits is to keep reminding us that these are marvelous things that we should not ever take for granted and that there is a form of spirituality and i completely agree with both of you 
in there is a spirituality of nature in Tolkien, which is very, very um, much of today's preoccupation because we've lost a certain appreciation of what's around us. Um, how do we get it back? Obviously, Tolkien is not going to unite uh, opponents and save the world, but he offers uh, an opportunity to rethink our relationship to our environment. And uh, I find that to be particularly inspiring. It's one of the things that I'm constantly preoccupied with uh, when I'm doing artwork is that the background is not just a backdrop. It's not just a, a painted curtain you drop behind the characters where the where the action takes place. It's a an active participant in the drama and in the storytelling. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's, that's one of the aspects of Tolkien, which once again, we understand intuitively as we read it without intellectually uh, analyzing it. And perhaps that's Tolkien's greatest strength across the board is that he offers us the opportunity to intuitively understand things and to, to, to not require um, as we are reading the intellectual effort to analyze them, that comes later on when you think, oh, you know, that that, that was quite amazing. And then you need to, 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 to ask yourself why. Why was it amazing? Why did it strike me so? Why did it engage me to such a degree? And that's where the, it, the other reading, that's where your homework starts. And, uh, and I find that to be absolutely fascinating because it is literally never ending. Um, you can't see it in the in the camera, but I have a, a huge um, library of books about the sources that Tolkien used, about the things that inspired him, about all of these, you know, all of this world building, all of these visions of the world from all of these periods that he found inspirational. And that's where the, that, that's really where the magic lies. And that magic can lie atop our own landscape and help us understand and interpret it. And that's perhaps one of the greatest gifts I think that Tolkien as an author has given us, um, you know, as readers. That's a wonderful place to stop. I'm afraid we've run out of time now, but to really enjoy this this whole conversation. That's been absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, thank you, Professor Nick Groom and Professor Dimitri Femi and Honorary Professor. We'll give you a professorship here and now. Uh, John Howe. Thank you uh, all for that really fascinating discussion. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much indeed and, and thank you to my uh, fellow uh, panellists. Thank you everyone and thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>